Good morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you are, and welcome to the latest edition of Free Thought Hour, the show where we have a guest. And tonight, well, it's tonight here, we have an academic. I'm really pleased to be able to tell you that we've got Nathan Lentz. But before I introduce him, say hello to Tercia. Hello, John. <laughs> hello, anybody else? How are you doing, John? I'm okay, thank you. And uh, I know you're in danger of going out, going into darkness at any moment. Well, I've got the inverter set up. So if about halfway through the show, the power should go out and then I'll just move the light slightly and I won't have any light behind me. But you have a new king. Congratulations on your new king. Well, technically yes. so do I because Africa is part of the Commonwealth. But yes. that's not why we're here tonight. We're not here to talk about kings and queens. That, that, that is yes. a different show. And, and we'll probably have one of specializing in that one day. Yeah. Good. Well, here he is. Nathan Lentz. Welcome, Nathan. Hi, how, how are, are you? you? We're okay. Thank you. How the devil are you? I'm doing great. It's a beautiful day here in New York City. Uh, spring has sprung in the last seven days or so. It's finally, the dreary days are over and it's, uh, it's beautiful weather. Good. Yeah, well, spring in New York and a bit of autumn too. They, they're the best times of year, aren't they? Because otherwise, it's either too hot or too cold. That's right. We, we get a sweltering summer and a freezing winter. And there's a lot of tourists also in the summer and the winter. So mm. the spring and fall really is the best. Mm. Yeah. Mm. So tell us about your work, because you've got, uh, you're a professor in, mm -hmm. what is it, uh, John James's college? No, I haven't got that right. John Jay. I? John Jay College. Uh, it, it's okay. the only uh, college uh, named after our first Chief Justice of the United States. Um, uh, John Jay College is the name of it. It was actually chosen by the students. It's a fairly young college. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, it's it used to specialize fairly specifically in criminal justice and, and law. And it's now, a, you know, kind of full liberal arts college, but it still has a special focus on criminal justice, uh, forensic mm -hmm. science. I actually teach in the forensic science program as well. Yep. Um, but I'm a geneticist. So I am in and I study evolutionary genetics uh, in my research lab. And that obviously has a forensic uh, link too, doesn't it? With, it with does, DNA. yeah, yeah. People often don't realize that, but um, the forensic genetics and the way that we do uh, evolutionary genetics has a lot of overlap in the techniques and, and the approaches. Oh. Um, and interestingly, actually, th there's good connections between forensic biology and you know basic science, biomedical science uh, oh. in general. Uh, so you know that's been. Uh, it's been like, for, 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 for example, anthropology is generally the area I work in within genetics, but yet mm. forensic anthropology is its own field as well, um, mm. that, you know, that, that bridges, you know, forensics and, and anthropology. So um, my, my, my home in a forensic science dominated place is actually pretty, a uh, lot more logical than it looks. <laughs> and I do forensic we projects as well, also, actually. Yeah, great. I want to introduce you to one of our previous guests who, uh, I'm trying to think of his first name, it's Davis is his second name. He's now a professor at Greenwich University and he specializes in working with the police and he's done work on um, the effectiveness of identification because mm -hmm. there are some people who are super recognizers and mm -hmm. whereas the rest of us, you can't, you know, recognize our parents <laughs> very often. <laughs> Super non-recognizers. <laughs> Nathan, before I, I have some questions about your technical work, but I'm coming from South Africa. I, I'd like to know if you could just quickly explain. I'm interested in this difference between a college and a university, and maybe it applies to anybody listening from the UK as well, because how exactly I'm interested in, in how does that stick together? And it's, it's so is it a university? Is it college that you, the one that you teach at, is it comparable to, for example, like a university? Um, mm -hmm. And are you involved with a faculty or because the word faculty in, in South Africa and I know in the UK possibly as well has different meaning, but it does in, um, could you just explain that to me? Just Can I just throw a spanner? Can I throw a spanner in this work? Mm -hmm. Throw your spanner, John, not now. There's, there's such a thing as a university college. 
Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, I know it is used a little a little differently in Britain, but uh, and and actually, there's two ways that the distinction is made in the United States. So the usual way, not the way where I'm from, but uh, the university I'm at, is where you have a large university. Um, you know, let's say Yale University, Harvard University, University of Michigan, whatever. And then you'd have colleges or schools within that university. So the arts and science would be one, business would be another. Uh, And they'd have departments within those colleges. So you have departments organized into colleges and then colleges are part of the university. But where I am, it's slightly different where you have a university system and that is the city university of New York. And then there are separate campuses um, and they're, and they, but they are colleges. They're called, so I work at John Jay College. There's also City College, Hunter College, Brooklyn College, Brooklyn College. They're all part of the city university. But those colleges, like mine, would be full fledged universities because we have majors across all the different areas, you know. So we would have multiple schools or colleges within us if we weren't already within something else. <laughs> so that's why we're a college and not a university, is that we're already within a university system. And it's the same thing um, at the State University of New York, but that's much so much of a larger system that they do have individual colleges within the within the, the separate unit. So it's it's complicated. Cool. And it's but, um, so John, our friend David Orenstein is with um, New York City University. Is that right? Well, no, New York University is different than the City University of New York. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. and what's even more complicated is that there's New York University and there's New York University Medical Center, which are actually separate entities. Um, they se- they share like logos and stuff like that, but they're administratively they're totally separate. So, uh, New York University, you know, has this weird distinction as well, and that's where okay, I did so my postdoctoral work. Let's move into something really basic and simple and easy to understand, like genetics. You know, let's just move away. <laughs> exactly. exactly, much simpler. <laughs> So, so you say. So you you deal with the human genome, which That's is right. interesting because it's it's topical, isn't it? Because in a couple of ways, recently, because the the first human genome was um, unravelled, uh, uh, decoded, whatever the appropriate word is, about thirty years ago, wasn't it? But that was done using the genes of one person, the genome of one person. But last week, they announced that they've done it again, and they've mushed together the genes from 40 people, and it's much more representative of uh, humanity as a whole because it's got all these different ethnicities within the the out- outcome. What is can you bring us up to date on that? What's, yeah, absolutely. What so the, the, the first the first relatively complete genome uh, was announced in 2001, and it was uh, based on a single uh, white white male, you know, a European male. Yeah. And yeah. the um, and it was recognized right away that that's not the best way to do it. So as new drafts, so we call them drafts or builds or assemblies of the human genome as they come out every few years. Um, you know, because we perfect our sequencing, we we annotate where the genes are, you know, so you have drafts, uh, they're still coming out. Um, as, as we move forward, we started to make them assemblages of multiple genomes. And so the previous one before the, this new announcement uh, was made with, with about 12 individuals, but most uh-huh. of it was all from eight individuals. And now we do, we just keep expanding it out. Um, yeah. the, but you do need what's called a reference genome. So, so another oh. for us to communicate with each other about the genome without having to send in t- the entire genome every time we want to share data, we only share differences from a reference. So it's very important to have one genome that we all consider our reference. And then uh-huh. that way, when I'm communicating with you about a genome, all I have to do is report the differences from yes. the reference. Because if, if I were yes, to yes. talk about the entire genome, I'd have to send you terabytes of data, but instead yes. I can send you kilobytes or megabytes because it, it's only, you know, difference in, it, it, I'm only reporting the differences from a standard, yes, yes. from a reference. Yes, yes. That's, this that's is about very- it. I, I want to ask something that I've, that I've often wondered about. So firstly, I have no background in biology or even the hard sciences. I'm a literature buff, but I'm trying to still, to, to myself, understand the whole idea of a gene and a genome. And while you were speaking, I was thinking, so could, could it be analogous to say, uh, I know that DNA stands for dionucleic um, acid, and, but so 
could it be analogous to saying a gene could be like a letter or um so so or say the way that a letter is to a word and words are to sentences so if, if we have 26 letters in the alphabet the, the, that um the gene would be like uh, the the way those an individual letter and then that the genome would be like a book so my genome would be yep. the book all my uh but combined out of only 26 letters of the roman alphabet would that be a good analogy for me to just understand it yeah yeah and even i i can make it even a finer point on it so what you have is letters and there's only four letters in the dna alphabet yeah. and then those yeah. combine to make words all right and then those words combine to make sentences. And I would say that the sentences are like genes. And yeah. then you have, um, well, depending on if you want to use the word chapter or whatever, but yeah, the whole book would be the genome and it would be a very large book indeed. It would be a yes. huge volume uh, because there is a lot, a lot of letters in our genome. But what we do know is about 75% of those letters are not actively doing anything uh, useful at any one time. Uh, so you have a bunch of sort of junk letters in reserve um, and whether or not um, that's by design or not is an open question. Um, but but a, a pair, so, sometimes that junk DNA does become useful again. So it's really it's it's like a junk drawer uh, in the sense that some of the parts in that junk drawer you can yeah, fish yeah. out and use again. <laughs> uh, so we do have genes that are dead that then become resurrected. Um, and all that. But but most of us, I would say all of us have uh, only about 25 percent of the books of, of the chapters and sentences are, are really being used at any one time. A lot of it's just junk that we carry around. And that number can be very different from species to species. But in humans, it's it's about 25 percent of our genome is functional. The rest, the, the other 75 percent is not. Um, and that's why the book is so large. Yeah. It, the, the other 75 percent is getting a free ride, isn't it? It's not not actually contributing to the individual that yeah. is in. It's and, even and worse than that. It's worse than that because it's much more likely to harm you, actually, because you can have parasitic yeah. elements uh, yes, that can yes. jump around uh, randomly, yes. and sometimes they jump around and crash into a gene uh, and then yes. and destroy the function. So, but, yes. but, so, so you have to think about it in short time scales and large time scales. So, in short time scales, that non functional DNA is not helpful, it's more likely to harm you, and all of that. But over the long run, it's a reservoir of material that could be yeah. useful in the yeah. future. So it's bad for the ant, but good for the ant hill. Yes, yes. Well, that's the whole thing, isn't it? Because um, a lot of people misunderstand evolution to the extent that they think it happens to individuals. And of course, that's completely wrong. It happens to populations. And mm -hmm. But then along came Richard Dawkins with the selfish gene. Mm -hmm. And although he he didn't really agree with that title, it was his publisher's idea of a title to make a book sell. Always. Um, the publishers always choose the title. <laughs> exactly. Yes, yes. And But what he did was he made the public more aware of the fact that um, it's a mistake to be homo sapiens egocentric mm -hmm. which you know previously was always the case we always thought that we were the best we were chosen or whatever we were the top of the tree and actually <laughs> it's all pretty much an accident mm -hmm. yeah i think that's true and and we're you know time will tell uh you know whether or not all of this great cognitive abilities that we have are really good for us or not <laughs> um mm. long term i mean we like Absolutely. to think of ourselves as the masters of the planet right now um mm. but you know a couple hundred years from now it might we might uh might be a different yeah. story because uh, we might very well implode in our civilization but most yeah. other living things will be just fine and be better off without us yeah. in fact yeah. so um you know we, we that that egocentric, we're on top and we're the best. You know that may, may, if we make it off of this planet, maybe. But if we don't, <laughs> uh, no, I, bacteria will I, reign again. <clears throat> so, so bacteria and fungi, I suppose that those are the uh, even, even as we speak, they're probably becoming the masters of the universe because our <laughs> small um, antibiotics are getting less and less effective as as the um, genetic arms race. Uh, continues but I want to ask about I love this an analogy that you gave about the book and the chapters 
because mm -hmm. that's something my simple mind can understand. But when, when people say that we share 995 or whatever percent of our genome with um, our nearest animal, well, <laughs> I, I regard us as animals too, but with our nearest non-human uh, relatives, does, does that then mean that the how would you put that anal analogous in in terms of letters and books and and chapters yeah no i'm glad you asked because there's a lot of misconception about that so uh you often see uh, it's about 98.5 percent uh shared sequence with chimpanzees they're, they're our closest living relatives and there, there's two species of, of chimpanzees um but that number is a little bit misleading um because there's two kinds of variation that we can see. One is where just a letter is switched out, where we have a T and they have an A at a certain position. Um, and that's really what that number is referring to. Um, so if you 98.5, what that means is about, um, you know, three bases out of a thousand, you know, or whatever, um, uh, will be randomly different here, here, there, and, and other places. But that's only one kind of variation. There's other kinds of variation. There's what we call length variation. So there are re regions of the genome that like an accordion can be different sizes. And uh, it's mostly because of its repetitive junk DNA. That, that, that's almost always the case. And that can expand and contract over evolutionary time. You get deletions or insertions and so forth, uh, duplications more, more, more accurately. Um, and so we have, if you, if you encounter, it, it depends on how you quantitate that, but then it's more like we have 4% difference between us and chimpanzees. So it depends on how you look at those differences. But here's the, the most important thing is we have almost all the same genes as they have. We have all the same chromosomes, although two uh, in our ancestry, two chromosomes fused together. But we have all the same chromosomes, all the same genes, pretty much. There are a few novel ones. Um, and so what we found is what makes us different than chimpanzees, or rather what, ch what makes chimpanzees different than us, is how we use those genes. It's the developmental timing, when they turn on, when they turn off, how much, you know, it, you can think of gene expression as every single gene has a large soundboard, a graphic equalizer, and there's all kinds of knobs and dials, and every gene has its own set of those. And so yes. much more evolutionary innovation uh, among close relatives is by tweaking those dials rather yes. than whole new genes. We don't have very many genes that are new. Um, and, and in fact, if you look at us and Neanderthals, we have, I don't think there's even a single gene uh, that's, that's new between those two lineages. But what we do have is the knobs and dials have been turned yeah. in ways. And that's, that's really it. And that's how you can get a brain that folds differently and so forth. So are we into epigenetics now then? Is this what the knobs and dials consist of? Um, well, that's one aspect of it, um, but even just at the, so epigenetics is uh, when you have changes that are not associated with the sequence itself. So it's modifications of the sequence. So you can have identical sequences that are used differently. That, that's not what I was referring to. I was referring to um, the sequence-based changes and, and, and there are upstream elements. So I'm, I'm using technical language here, but if you have a gene, those elements that are, are the knobs and dials, you make little changes there. That's what I meant. And that is to the sequence. On top of that, you can also have uh, chemical modifications of genes. And that's that's epigenetics. Yeah. Um, and, and some of that is even heritable. So you can have things that you inherit from your parents that is not showing up in any of the genome itself, but rather in the chemical modifications that makes a gene more or less likely to be expressed at a certain time or place. It gets incredibly complicated very quickly. Yes. And it was one of the big disappointments of the genomics era has been we were looking for for patterns that would explain gene expression across thousands of genes. And it's it's just not the case. Every gene really is regulated separately and independently. Yes. So what we learn for one gene, you know, really doesn't tell us much about another one. We have to sort of solve it one gene at a time. Uh, yes. So the genome, the, the genome sequence was just the beginning of oh. understanding. But if you yeah. think, if you go back to language and the analogy, there, there's similarities there because, you know, the same word, um, you know, sequence can be read differently. You have homographs, for example. So even in the same language, the same, the, the same word, you know, deer and deer, right? So you have homographs, you have homophones, but even across languages, you have cognates where they're not used identically, even though they look the same, you know, and, exactly. and you have accent marks that can change, um, yeah. you know, the same letters can be read differently based on accent marks. And so that that's a that's a, that's epigenetic, yeah. if you will, is accent yeah. marks and things like that.
Right. So th this was a bit of an upset, wasn't it, a few years ago when the experiment was done with uh, fat mice and it was shown that they could, in, they could pass on their tendency to overeat through about six generations. And suddenly everybody was crying out, Lamarckism was true. Yeah, um, definitely La Lamarck has seen something of a revival uh, yes. lately, uh, you know, in limited context, but definitely some, some things do get passed on outside of the genetic sequence. So, and, and, and that are a function of what you're exposed to during your life. But one thing to remember is that the only material you pass on genetically is in the sperm and the egg. And so, right. So, so, you know, there's very few exposures uh, that you have in your lifetime that affect your sperm in the egg genetically or epigenetically. Um, but when it does that, that could be passed on. So, um, uh, you know, I, I think we are going to see epigenetics uh, phenomena, epigenetic phenomena in inheritance, but it'll be pretty limited. I, I, I don't think anyone's expecting, you know, huge, uh, you know, revelations there, but um but the ones we have seen have been pretty surprising. So, yeah, I want to come back to Dean's question in a minute. But first of all, what you've been talking about there triggers a resonance with me over behavior, because, of course, originally people didn't think behavior could be inherited. But now they've come to accept, you know, by by doing things like trying to herd sheep with a wolfhound, they, they had to realize that behavior is, is inherited. Mm -hmm. To some extent, at least. And so now you're making me think um, the, the overeating behavior is something that can be inherited. So it's all muddy now. There's, there's no clear boundaries anywhere. So yeah, you're right. And I think that a, a um, large system, what's called systems biology, where you kind of connect all of these different um elements into one larger picture. I think that's going to be the future um, of understanding the, these phenomena because um, because it's even more than than you said. So so if you if you think about overeating or, or you know, obesity, that, that, that kind of thing, you know, we have genetics, you have epigenetics, but there's another layer on this, too. And that is the microbiome. So the oh, yeah. these are the microbes that live in your in your intestines. They both respond to your diet, but they also influence your diet in terms of what yes. what food you go after. Yes. And that can be inherited, too. <laughs> you know, your your first microbiome comes from, uh, well, fetal exposure. Uh, and then, of course, uh, through what you're exposed during the birthing process and then what you're exposed to through breastfeeding and everything else. And so microbiomes do associate with families and, and geographies and, the, and diet types. And and that affects things as well. So and they're all it's a complex interplay and also it's just cultural, cultural uh, aspects. Yes, I mean, yes. cu cultural evolution isn't. Um, you know, a lot of biologists don't pay enough attention to cultural evolution uh, yeah. to our to our discredit. Yeah, so now uh, we're, talk we're talking about memes now. Yeah, <laughs> that speaks to to Dean um, Dean's question about the divergence from uh, of Homo sapiens from other hominid species, whether it was uh, diet, environment, combination. I, I would say probably combination. Um, because yeah, a combination. I mean. <laughs> The very simplistic um, uh, view of this was that the ancestors of hominins, you know, humans and our, and our relatives away from uh, uh, apes was really a transition away from the arboreal lifestyle, the, the rainforest obligate tree living. Um, that's a simplified view, but it was a major transition when our ancestors sort of left the rainforest. Um, and it, and it, was, it happened in stages. And, and actually, to be clear, we didn't leave the rainforest. The grasslands came to us because the rainforest yes. shrunk. <laughs> um, so, so our ancestors found themselves in, in less tree-filled environments. And so that, that was the first major transition was the upright walking and upright posture um, as we spent most of our life on the ground rather than in the trees and, and not even among the trees. So it was borders. So you, they were kind of bi-adapted at first and then they kind of got more uh, standard terrestrial adaptations. Um, and that, for some reason, that really set us on a different trajectory because our relatives at the time who, who remained in the rainforest have, you know, lived pretty much the same way they did, um, yeah. you know, 10 million years ago. They didn't undergo any major transitions, although there is evidence that they're getting more uh, cognitive abilities in terms of tool use. But um, our ancestors really got set on a different trajectory that put evolution in warp drive. 
And some of it was standing upright that clearly began the process and freed up our hands. Um, yeah. But there was also, a, you know, we were big brain to start with. We were living in particular kinds of social groups. And this yes. idea of, of division of labor really started to come out. And I think the freeing of the hands was part of that. Um, yes. So there was, I think it was just a combination of all kinds of things. And, um, and so we went from, you know, vegetarian to more kind of scavenger and omnivorous diets. And then, and then animal products started to become a bigger part, uh, you know, around the time of Homo erectus, there were clearly hunters. Um, and, you know, so that was the preferred food. And that I think it was just kind of a perfect storm of all of those features because mm. because the question remains like why haven't dolphins, for example, um, began building cities because they're very intelligent. They have very big brains and they're, you know, their brain to body size is almost like ours. You know, with another few million years, are they going to start, you know, farming? Well, you know, who knows? But they don't right. have hands. So it's, it's just hard to imagine. Not having hands is a handicap. <laughs> very much so or, or, or they, they're just too smart because they know that when they start building cities that there's going to be somebody who's going to collect taxes so yeah. maybe they're just keeping keeping, keeping. <laughs> well I mean I, you might be onto something a lot of people I mean we've sort of moved away from this a little bit but there was a thinking in, in anthropology circles that farming was probably the biggest mistake we ever made yes, <laughs> yes, was, yes. To stop living as foragers and start yes. living a sedentary lifestyle, and really all of our social pro and it's true that all of our social problems really began uh, yes. with farming. Because once you start to have surpluses, you start to have wealth, and once you have wealth, you have wealth inequality. Once you have wealth inequality, you no longer have egalitarian social structure, and power dynamics, and blah blah blah. So there's a lot. I, for one, don't want to go back to a foraging lifestyle. So I don't really have the solution. <laughs> I, I, I don't think we, I don't think it's possible. I don't think we can go back. I think mm -hmm. once I, I think in any in any um, species, I don't think it's only with us. Um, I don't think it's possible to go back. Uh, um, I, I just think things are what they are, and 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 if some things you just can't turn back the clock. But um, Nathan, yeah. I want to ask about uh, just before the show I began to listen to one of the speeches that you gave I think this was um, at the CFI so you, you gave two um, talks at the CFI the one was about the glitches in the human design if you want to call it that which is which I try to avoid because I don't think we were designed but um, and the other one is is uh, that I've almost finished watching was about how how we're using genetics in the genome to create revolutionary um, medicines and treatments for diseases but then the one that particularly interests me was the one that, that I will finish later tonight about justice and how how um, this was at I think this is at your university the found the biological foundations for justice I, I found that, that that idea um, so I'm definitely going to listen to this I think it was six years ago three I don't know if you can remember I don't recall now that sounds about right yeah yeah. So, so, so the, this and, and what we've just spoken about, how how um, becoming sedentary and farming changed the way that we live together as a society. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm just breaking everything. It made it possible to have property. That was the thing about farming. Yeah. It, once, yeah. In a nomadic lifestyle, you can only carry a little. Yeah. <laughs> well, once, and and also said, land. The the idea of land ownership. Yes. You know. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. But, You're right. but that that reminds me uh, or makes me think a lot about the work that Robert Sapolsky has done mm -hmm. on on um, how how our, our biology determines how how we behave, and uh, that I suppose that when you study genetics, then you you also look at how that's inherited. Um, so, would you say talk a little bit to the biology? The biological foundations of justice is that something you could um... yeah i mean i with that uh, that was that came from my first book but also a couple of articles that i wrote basically just i was i was trying to influence the field of criminal justice a little bit to, to take into account our biology because um most people think that that science especially biology has no no place in understanding criminal justice you know policies or or how, you know how we should um you know approach criminal deviance and, and so forth. But actually, I, I argue that it absolutely should do that because there's a there's a way to work in concert with how we're naturally built in terms of our yes. psychology. And there are ways that go against that. So let me just give you 
let me let me just try to build up to this. So first of all, what our sense of justice, you know, comes from our recognition of fairness. That's number one, but also empathy, uh, reciprocity. So these all kind of build into what we call a moral sense, like this is right and this is wrong. So we build codes around that to discourage negative, you know, behavior that we find um, antisocial and we try to promote behaviors that we find social. Okay. But what happens when something goes wrong, when you have deviant behavior? So that's that's um, where I think, it, at least in the United States especially, but in the UK a, a little bit as well, uh, we really go against our natural sense. I mean, our natural uh, instincts when it comes to behavior. Instead, we get so tripped up on the justice and the fairness aspects of it that we actually make, I think, profound mistakes. And here's what I mean. Okay, so if some if there's an infraction, if somebody has violated a social norm, one thing that we do is we remove them from the group temporarily. So that, you know, if it's a child, you have a timeout, you know, or a suspension, or if they're an adult, you might have imprisonment or, or other loss of liberty or restriction of liberty. So that's, that's the first step, unfortunately. And, and that is shared with other animals, by the way, animals ostracize for offenses. Yes. Every animal species that is social has some codes of behavior as well, some expectations. And when you violate that, a shunning or an ostracization process takes takes place. And that's how the animal recognizes that they've screwed up. But unfortunately, with humans, that's where we stop. And we just say, see, wasn't that bad? Now don't do it again. But the next step after after shunning is supposed to be a reconciliation where people yes. are welcomed back into the group uh, yeah. with with apologies and forgiveness and reintegration. And that's what we do not do very well. Because in the United States, anyway, we want to punish people forever. We take away their yes. right to vote. We take away other rights, you know, permanently. We label them felons. They have to they have to write it on their job applications. And what that does is that makes them internalize the concept that they're not a member of society. And when yes. you're not feeling like a member, you don't feel committed to the safety and security and prosperity of that society. But what animals do is they reintegrate you so that you remember that you are part of the group. You're expected to behave. And we want you there. And so some, some Scandinavian countries have sort of picked up on this idea and they've built a, a prison that's much more about reconciliation and restoration of relationships than it is about punishment. But the problem is you have to also accept that when someone breaks the law, the best thing to do is to be kind to them. Yes. <laughs> and nobody wants to do that. We want to punish them. Um, yeah. But in, in Norway, when you go to prison, you, it's, it's, it's nice. It's like you get an apartment. They teach you job skills. They give you a therapist. They say, what went wrong in we, your life? We want, to, we want you to be with us. We want you to behave in a social way. We care about you. And they're like, wait, you give them free job training? Yes, because we yeah. want them back. Yes, you you give them free food and nice housing? Yes, because we don't want them to feel bad about themselves. Mm. <laughs> that doesn't accomplish and, and, anything. You can observe this in, in chimpanzees, can't you? Because exactly. after a dispute, they get back together, they have a little cuddle and yeah. say, we've forgiven you, it's all yeah. over now. Mm -hmm. Yes. And, uh, and with species like bonobos, I mean, where the women are in charge, just um, mm -hmm. if you pay any attention, uh, <laughs> that the, they use um, sexual pleasure as, mm -hmm. as a means of reconciliation women, uh, across, across the genders. So, but something else that that you said made me think uh, this this idea that when you ostracize somebody, and I can see that that, that a deviant um, has to be removed at least temporarily, mm -hmm. but do if you don't follow up and do the next thing, that person who's been ostracized, their um, uh, inclination to then adjust their behavior to fit in with society, they become yeah. less and inclined because they're not the, the the feeling of i'm not part of society in any case so mm. why would i then adjust my behavior right. to yeah. fit in the, the incentive yeah. to 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 behave more um pro-socially becomes less and less the more you enforce the ostracist uh, the punishment um aspect mm. um, yes. if you dehumanize me i'm not inclined to behave very human yeah yeah that's right and <laughs> Um, the the experiments that have been done with this in the countries that had a, a more humane approach, they speak for themselves. The results do. I mean, because people reintegrate and they don't reoffend. Uh, but in the United States, the vast majority of people who leave prison come back. Um, yes, they yes. reoffend. Yeah. Uh, and we love a, we love a good turnaround story, but we make it very hard for that to happen. Yeah. We make it very unlikely for that to happen. And it, it's so ironic well, that we. Sorry, John. Go ahead. 
I was just going to say, can I link this to religion? Because it's famous for being a source of shunning and mm -hmm. absolute shunning. You know, close the door forever on people who have not obeyed their particular code. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the irony being that their own scriptures preach a different way <laughs> to approach. I mean, well, um, I, it's like I Gandhi said, I, I, I love Christianity, but I don't love Christians. <laughs> I mean, yes. because if they followed their own Bible, they would see that's exactly what their founder yes. um, uh, promoted. Yeah. But because um, there is a sense that that is the right thing to do, but we just can't do it. And I think that religion a lot of times gives people excuse uh, and cover for their worst instincts rather than their best ones, but yes, uh, yes. but that's very important. I, I mean, re religion tends to amplify the you know the instincts that you already have. But. Can I throw in a couple of things? I want to get you talking about anthropomorphism mm -hmm. because when I was doing my first degree, I did it long long time ago. I did a degree in biology, and anthropomorphism was a big no no. It was a dirty word. Oh, you're, you're seeing things that aren't there. But, I mean, 50 years later, it's pretty obvious that we behave in particular ways. And when we see animals doing the same sort of thing, there's no reason to not think that they're doing it for the same reason, the same, you know, motive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that... Um with maybe not the word, but the concept of anthropomorphizing um, has seen a big, uh, you know, renaissance or resurgence lately uh, with scientists like Franz de Waal and, and, yeah. um, you know, Mark Beckoff, a lot of people are starting to, um, you know, really, really turn away from that um, and to not dehumanize animals rather. And, and also to remember that we're, we're animals and that we share a lot of those. And I think that um, the idea that there's nothing going on internally uh, with an animal, I, I think that we're. I think that the tide is fully turned on that now, and I think most animal behaviorists really do think about the animal as as living in a society, as being yeah. motivated by very similar things that motivate us. Yeah. Um, so I, I think that we have that, but I do think that was our low point in understanding animal behavior yeah. was yeah. for the yeah. 1920s through 1960s. Yes, um, yes that's right. Yeah, yeah. Well, and I would uh, just think well, where we'd be if we hadn't lost those 40 years, really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like Tercia said, she considers us to be an animal. Of course, that's a view that's fairly recent because, again, mm -hmm. linking this to religion, it's um, human exceptionalism has been mm -hmm. underlined by scriptures, hasn't it? But yeah. I'm, I'm going to put a picture up here for you to comment on. Take a look at this. Mm -hmm. Now, what? how do you react to that? Well, it's a family is what it looks like to me. Um, and, and, uh, you, if, if humans did not invent the concept of family and about caring about your family. Um, and, um, you know, animals spend a lot of time in affectionate contact with one another, um, and not just for procreative reasons. I mean, there's a lot of reasons why, um, you know, they seek that and they seek validation in many of the same ways that yeah. I think animals are motivated by all the same, same things that motivate us. And, yeah, um, and I think emotions uh, generally are just drivers of behavior. That's how I like to think of them. And you have simple emotions like hunger and more complex ones like jealousy. But what they're essentially doing is driving behaviors, which is different than feeling. I, you can't mix up emotions and feelings in a conversation like this. Uh, I don't know about animal feelings. I don't know how they feel about anything. But I, I, the way that emotions work in the brain, um, humans don't have any emotions that the other animals don't have. No, no, no. So we, Anybody who's had a pet dog knows that they have the same sort of emotion. They feel grief and they, mm -hmm. they, they can express happiness and so on. Yeah. yeah I'm going to sure. now play a very short clip of something which came from the 1960s and which is out and out anthropomorphism, the bad sort. Take a look at this. Sweet one, Mix, all right. Watching the builders is one thing, but doing the building is quite another. Come on, where have you been? Well, I've been as quick as I can. You've been as quick as I can. Look at the time. That's just the sand and cement. Now go and get some water. That's what we need. Some water. We'll never get this giraffe house finished. I don't know. Slow coach. Oh, shut up. That'll do. No water. Oh, they have no water, dear. Here you are. I brought you a drop of water. Thank you very much. 
Now, you must learn how to do this. Would you like to try? No, you... <laughs> it was for entertainment, of course, which is, which is the excuse, I suppose. But he was voicing what he imagined the animals were communicating to him and to each other. And, and, and that was the reason that anthropomorphism got a bad name, I think, because of that sort of activity. Yeah, I think so, too. And I think that there, I mean, not that humans do have a tendency to see things through our own lens. I mean, yeah, that, yeah. That's normal and natural. But I think appreciating animal experiences under their own terms um, has really been, you know, um, the cause for a long time. And in fact, animal behavior in laboratories is really is really found just in psychology departments anymore. Um, yes. And so with biology and zoology, ethology, um, understanding behavior in their natural context has been uh, much more the cause of the day. So I think that, uh, like I said, I think the tide's really turned on that. You won't find a lot of, um, um, you know, captive animal. Uh, well, with primates you do, but w w really with most other species, if you're not watching an animal in the wild, you're really you're really not understanding what they're up to. Um, yeah. and, and actually, it was a British woman, Jane Goodall, who really taught us yeah, that. Yeah. You have yeah. to watch an animal at least for a full generation before you yes, can yes. begin to understand how they behave and why they behave. And yeah. what's interesting, what's interesting about chimpanzees actually watching them is that she also found a lot of regional differences in their yes, behavior yes. Um, that yes. cannot be explained by genetics. And so the culture, the way that culture shapes the way you behave, um, mm. it matters a lot, not just in humans, but in other species. They really, um, if you just took a, ra a group of random chimpanzees that were born as babies and go put them somewhere, they would not build a society anything close to the ones that we see in Africa because those have been developed and inherited and taught. Um, you know, you grow up as a chimpanzee in a certain way and that determines how you behave. Um, and in fact, gorillas in Rwanda have been changing the way that they, they live uh, from ways that we thought that they couldn't live. They, they are, yes. they're experimenting. And so culture really shapes animal behavior as well. Um, yes. in, in an inherited way. <laughs> so, so, so to anybody, um, any youngsters out there studying or contemplating some field work, I'm thinking of the work that Robert Sapolsky did with his um, troop of baboons in uh, the Serengeti. Mm -hmm. And I just imagine, so it's, I, I've never, ne never thought about this influence of culture. I can just imagine doing research on the behavior of uh, a troop of baboons at Cape Point, where mm -hmm. there's a lot of human interaction. And there's like, it's actually... If you if you look up Cape Point baboons, it's actually a bit of a problem because they're interacting with the tourists and but mm -hmm. that's their habitat. That's where they live. They're not tame baboons. But I can just imagine that it would be a fascinating study to look at the influence of the culture in a, a troop of wild baboons at Sea Point compared to a troop of wild baboons in the Serengeti. Uh, yeah. No, the the presence of humans is just another factor in their ecology, and and that will well, affect how. And not even just humans. I mean, I mean, in terms of of the uh, the Serengeti is a is a savanna felt, where, whereas Cape Point is mountainous. Mm -hmm. um, there's the ocean close by. If you took out the humans, just the 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 physical, um, geological, and and uh, habitat is is so vastly different in terms of prey animals and. And, and things like that. Uh, but we have, I'm keeping an eye on the clock as I dutifully should do. Uh, so I have, I have two questions. Um, you can decide which one is the one to answer. Uh, one you can answer just with straight yes or no. It's, it's my pet uh, question. John, I don't know if you can guess what it is. I want to ask Nathan if he believes that we have free will or not. Oh, right. <laughs> just, I mean, just, just yes or no, just a quick answer to that. Um, you can decide. Um, but, but then the, I was thinking, um, being a lecturer and being a professor and teaching and me preparing to interview you, is, can you think of a question that you wish one of your students or anybody interviewing you would ask you? Hmm. Okay. I'll, I'll ruminate on that second question while I, I think about the first one. So the... Um, the question of free will, the question of free will, um, I'm agnostic for the most part. And I have very, I, 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 I almost avoid it actively in the sense that I don't think we know near enough to answer that question. 
Um, I think it's a very useful illusion if even if we don't have it. Uh, I, I think I would if I had to like wager like I was forced to take a position, I would probably say no, we don't. I, I'm pretty deterministic. It just everything we see seems very, very deterministic down to the level that we're capable of seeing right now. Um, and and I, it's just hard to imagine how it would interact with the physical world as something like a will. Um, however, um, I, I think it's such a useful way to think about behavior, um, especially when it's informed by evolutionary context, like we were talking about before, that I think it's an idea worth holding on to, even if it's false. <laughs> right. Um, because, I mean, a lot of Einstein showed that, um, you know, classical physics, most of that's actually wrong. Right. But it mm. still operates at the scales that we live in. Yes. So it's useful. Yes. It's still useful, yes. even though it's wrong. Right. So I think the same thing could be true for free will, that, that we can understand that it probably doesn't exist, but we still get the outcomes we want when we behave as if it does. So I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to keep free will around as an idea. The <laughs> second question that you that you raised is, what do I wish people would ask me? Um, oh, I don't know. Um, I mean, I can get talking about all kinds of things. I, I think. um, um I mean, I'm pr I have to say I'm pretty gloomy right now, so I don't like a lot of questions about, you know, like the future of human evolution or, um, you know, I, I just I just think the next century or two um, are going to be a rough time for our species. And there's not a lot of reason to think we're going to come through it as a spacefaring people like most people, like most oh. science fiction, you know, um, you know, post apocalyptic science fiction is one thing. But, you know, most people sort of have this sense that within a couple of hundred years, we'll be traveling around the solar system. I'm not sure that we're going to have even what we have now, 100 years from now. I just think that yeah. we're so close to collapse in so many different ways. Um, so I'm pretty gloomy about the future. So I, I, I tend not to like those kinds of questions because it just puts me in a bad mood. Um, <laughs> um, so so how, do, how, do you, how do you feel about um, euthanasia? <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, ethically, you know, I, I don't know. Um, I'm certainly a, um, uh, in favor of, you know, assisted suicide as a rational choice. Um, but I don't know about euthanasia. <laughs> so, drag, dragging you back to Jane Goodall, who is hmm. we're celebrating her at the moment here Good. in the UK. Because she's, she's retired back home and is getting quite a lot of airplay on... Um, Jim Al Khalili type shows. I don't know if you're familiar with these mm -hmm. Radio Four um, life scientific sorts of uh, documentary interview type shows, and uh, there were it was contentious because back in the early days, to get the filming that they wanted, in order to get the funding that they needed, she fed the chimpanzees with bananas, and of course that was a huge upset intrusion falsification of their environment yeah and they had uh, they had arguments between them because of course there was um what's his name the the human fossil guy um uh, i can't remember but he was very much against them feeding bananas they had to do it on the sly in order to get the the national geographic coverage that was that was paying their bills yeah um, maybe you're talking about Leaky, either Richard yes. Leakey or Lewis Leaky. Okay, yeah. yeah. I mean, I think that um, obviously we all play the game of, of, of funding. Like you, our work is expensive. All research is expensive, especially field work and things like this. So you have to play the game a little bit. And 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 you, there's this fine line between sensationalization, sensor, sensationalism, uh, and other where you're really getting almost dishonest. And then, but you know, you're but. You know, it's also normal to present your best self. I mean, you don't yes. you don't show up to a, a dinner in your pajamas, right? You put on your best suit, and and yes. you don't live like that. No, you know, but everyone understands that you don't. So it's it's complicated. Um, but the idea, but what's fascinating to me about that story, though, is it also taught us a little bit about chimpanzees. So that when you are providing the bananas on a regular basis and they come to expect it, their culture adapts to that. Again, you're just a feature of their environment. And so they're going to adapt their behavior. And I think it shows us, too, is that behavior is malleable. You have a range. It's not infinitely malleable, but behavior is malleable. And the most successful species are the ones that have the most malleability that can live in different kinds of climates. And I don't just mean, you know, weather, but I mean, you know, what's available to them, uh, what the predators are, what the food sources are and all that, um, you know, being a generalist 
um, is the best long-term strategy. The problem is being a specialist is a good short-term strategy. Yes. So, yes. so that's why I, what's special about humans, if there's anything really special about us, it's that we are the ultimate generalists. We're really not yes. specialized yes. to do almost anything. Um, yes. We are very, very generalist. And that's why we, it takes a big brain to be that kind of flexibility. Yes. Um, yes. So, I, and, I, I, and I think that, that, that bananas with, with, um, but Jane Goodall showed the flexibility that chimpanzees have and, yeah, and yes, really yes. intelligence, ecological intelligence. Yes. Would you like to tell us a bit about this book, Human Errors, a panorama sure. of our glitches from, yeah. I see I missed out the M, Pointless Bones to Broken Genes. What's that yeah. all about? So this is a book that's in the tradition of The Ancestor's Tale, which was a, a book by Richard Dawkins. And there's a couple other books that it's it, it's, it, it, it takes off from. The idea that human... Uh, that um, evolution does not produce perfection uh, or anything close to it. Evolution is a game of being just good enough, yeah, uh, yeah. Which, which means there's a lot of examples of sort of suboptimal design where yes, to yes. get a better design involves steps that are not advantageous along the way. So there's just too much of a, a hill to climb to get to a better structure. Can um, I stop you there a minute? Because mm -hmm. I argue a lot or debate, I like to call it debate, with uh, with Christians on social media and, and on this show, for example, and they have, they commit the cardinal sin of imagining that mutations, which they think are the only mechanism of evolution, must be either beneficial or detrimental. Right. <laughs> there's no such thing. There's no yeah. good and there's no bad. There's just stuff. Yeah. And it and goes, that... it goes through a filter. So yes. the way I like to say it is that life is a is constantly generating diversity, genetic diversity, behavioral diversity, all kinds of diversity is it's just part and parcel of how nature works to constantly yes. be generating this diversity all over the place, all kinds of diversity in multiple different layers. And then you throw it gets thrown out into the world and what's successful persists and unsuccessful doesn't. But what but what those selective forces are changes over time. So you can be very well adapted for a certain amount of time and then the environment changes and you're not adapted anymore, uh, not well adapted. And so you have to change again. And so what the book is about is collecting a lot of examples of our own physiology uh -huh. from genes and cells all the way to organ systems and even behavior that are really really if they were intelligently if they were designed they were not intelligently designed because there's very obvious better designs in all of these examples and but so but the story is not just like an encyclopedia of glitches what it is is it is each one of these glitches tells us a story about our past mm -hmm. about the way we used to live and then when you can understand that your body is shaped for a very different world than we now live in you can live yeah. in better harmony uh with it but one thing I do want to say, I want to say something very provocative, number one, because it sells books, number two, um, because um, I, it's a strong claim that, I'll, that I defend in the book. And that is, I think in most ways, we're actually the most flawed creature, uh, at least among mammals, but maybe even among vertebrates, yes. we're the most flawed yeah. ones of all. And people yeah. are like, how, how can you say that? I was like, it's because precisely because of our intelligence and our, our social structure that your body doesn't have to be perfect, yeah, yeah. right? So if you don't see very well, there's certain jobs you can't do and other jobs you do fine. If you're not very fast, if you if you have even birth deformities uh, mm -hmm. and, and different kinds of bodies, but you're still smart, you can contribute and you're a valuable member of society. You don't have to be good at all of it. You just have to have some way that you can contribute. So yeah, we're, yeah. The first, we're the first species that really um, that allows that kind of diversity even within us. Right. You have yeah. hunters, but you have gatherers, you have homesteaders, you have shamans, you have leaders. Um, you know, there's all kinds of different ways that you can contribute. And, but what that means, though, is it takes the selective pressure off of our bodies. And yes. that's why I think we have the most of these glitches yes. <laughs> um, yes. because they didn't kill us because we're, we of all this other stuff. It didn't kill us. Yes. I think that, that humans are the only species that I can think of so far that we, we are the only ones who can actually actively, uh, through our smartness, end up destroying ourselves along with our entire environment. Um, other species... Uh, the, the um, well, I mean, there, there's certainly examples of, of species who can evolve their way into a, an evolutionary dead end, like an extinction. You know, they evolve, they become so specialized 
and then they eat up all the food and then they're gone, you know, whatever. And there are but other invasive make... species that can destroy ecosystems as well. And, but and then... we make decisions. We, we plan things. We make well, a plan. And now we're back we... to the free will question. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> so, 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 but, but we go about it different. We have because of our brains, we have such an influence on our environment. But the environment is so much larger still than our brains and our c capability to foresee all the possible consequences of everything we do, that we can very easily end up uh, destroying ourselves and our environment because we're so smart. Um, with with the, way, the way that I would say it is, we're the only species that knows better. And still does it, that's, right? That's so we way. know better, and we still like do it. because because evolution has never rewarded like self restraint and discipline oh. and knowing your place and making room for others. Evolution has never rewarded that kind of behavior. Yeah. So that's yeah. that's why it's not natural to us either. You have to really overcome a lot of your natural instincts in order to live in a sustainable way. Because I mean, that was one of Dar Darwin's first big revelations: was every species generates way more offspring. Then the environment can support mm. and then it mm. sets up some competition and that's what keeps the selective pressure that was this big thing is if you look around you know two two birds two migratory birds come and make a nest and they have all these eggs and all these chicks but yet if every couple did that the population should be growing and it's not it's stable it's mm. because most individuals don't survive and that was one of darwin's big revelations oh wow everything is struggling except us you know we're taking care of each other we're living and that's why you know, that's the problem in a sense. But um, uh, yeah, no, I think that all species have that in common. It's just humans should know better. And the fact that we have all of the information that we need to, to understand climate change, resource sustainability, alternative energy, even almost all major sources of pollution. There's no, we're not waiting around for scientific solutions for no. any of these, any of these. It's all will, political will. Because yes. if we wanted to go to green energy, we could convert the entire planet to green energy in 10 years. The problem yes. is very wealthy people would lose a lot of money. And that's why we're not doing it. That's yes. the only reason. So they, we don't have free will, but there definitely is such a thing as political will. <laughs> yes. And it's collective. And that's the problem is that there's no one person responsible. Um, and so... You know, the rest of us, you're like, wow, I'm making all of these sacrifices and these CEOs are jumping in their private planes every day. Mm. So mm. why am I bothering? Why am I sorting my recycling? Does it make any difference whatsoever? Mm. So positive. Oh. <laughs> Next That's week. why I'm gloomy. That's why I'm gloomy. It's like, how can you be... <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. Next, next week, we've got somebody who will bring a different point of view to this. It's Tim Bolland, who has been on our show before, uh, so you can see him in the archive. But he has got some, he thinks that everything is intelligent. You can track it back, and uh, there's a word for it, a uh, paro something or other. Uh, but you, you, even the smallest atoms and quarks and something have this consciousness about them and well watch him next week yeah uh, i'm fascinated to hear what he says because the idea of, of a universal consciousness is um it's fascinating to me i mean it's in what in many ways it's kind of academic but at the others it's found and it really changes the way you think about anything but um i i i'll be watching great thank you okay well thank you very much do you know thank you I, I'd like I'd like you to stay around. I'm going to end the show now because it's almost very few seconds left in our hour. But I want you to stay around because I want to talk to you afterwards, Nathan. I've got a, prop a proposal for you. Okay. Great. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, viewers. There's some more stuff here that I haven't screened. Dean has been contributing. And so has uh, Chris Bateman. And there's another one from Dean. And so we've had some interaction with our audience, which is very nice. <laughs> You're Amazing. welcome to do that, guys. Please come and do that again. Mm. Okay, so thank you very much. And say goodbye, because I'm about to play your tailored outro. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye-bye. <laughs>